Everyone knows what the world of the dinosaurs look like because they're featured in so many books and movies. But the Permian was another world away from that, with a wealth of weird animals that most people don't know anything at all about. And some people think that human history occupies most, if not all, of the history of the world. And they imagine that there's this little bit right there at the beginning when dinosaurs and dimetrodons and mammoths and such all lived at the same time for just a little while before they went extinct all at once for no good reason. At this point in our series, we're looking at the Middle Permian about 265 million years ago. And think about how long ago that was. 200 million years before the time that the dinosaurs went extinct. So you jump into your retro encabulator and travel all the way back to the last dinosaurs. And then keep going another three times that far. That's how long ago this was. If you started in the Permian 265 million years ago and then went another 265 million years even further back in time, you'd get to episode six of this series in the early Cambrian when multicellular animals just started to get interesting. So where I am now in the middle Permian is as far from the Cambrian explosion as you are in the modern day. And yet, we're 18 episodes into the series and we still haven't gotten up to the time of the dinosaurs yet. In the last episode, we looked at therapsids, the first animals to show signs of being warm-blooded. We can't tell exactly when they started raising their temperature, but we see subsequent adaptations to accommodate that. The first indications that show up in fossils is a change in proportions of bodily extremities. The most notable of these changes is a reduction in the length of the tail to better preserve warmth. In a previous episode of this series, I mentioned classic cars and the evolution of automobiles to explain parallels in biological evolution. And that's a useful illustration here too, so I'll use it again. When I was born, American automobiles were big long boats, and if you ever get a chance to ride in one, they're, they're kind of float. Uh, their suspension's really bad. And part of the problem was that they had these huge trunks that dragged way behind the back tires. And the manufacturers did that on purpose because they thought that was the best way to support the weight of the car. But it really hurt the handling. It was so bad, and I'm not kidding, that they used to build berms into the road so that when the road turned, it also went up on one end, like a Hot Wheels track. Because the suspension and handling on these old cars was that bad. Then they came out with pony cars, with a little trunk and a tiny back seat, so the back end of the car was a lot closer to the back wheels, and those cars could corner a lot better. And nowadays, they put the back tires at the back of the car. And you can still buy cars with lots of trunk space, but that trunk is nestled between the rear wheels rather than six feet behind them like they used to be when I was a kid. And similarly, the evolution of amphibious forms into mammal-like reptiles once saw these huge, thick tails dragging behind those back legs in much the same way, whereas therapsids began to reduce those long tails. They don't drag on the ground anymore, and they don't hold you back, and they're actually better at balancing the animal while running or climbing or jumping or whatever. And this is necessary because warm-blooded animals are much more active and energetic than crocodiles and lizards ever could be. This first indication of endothermy was immediately followed by a suite of others in the next lineage that we look at, theriodonts, which means they have mammal-like teeth. If you've only ever seen one species out of all these things before, it was probably this one. The genus name is Inostrancevia, but that sounds too light and fluffy for a beast like this. So most people know it by its much more ominous family name, Gorgonopsid. Its temporal fenestra was wider to allow bigger jaw muscles for a more powerful bite, and it may be the first of many saber-toothed predators. Oversized canines have been a recurrent theme throughout Theriodontia, including placental mammals and marsupials, and not just among carnivores either, but herbivores too. We've got things that have no reason to have saber tooth and no use for them, but there they are. Gorgonopsids, however, apparently used them. Inostrancevia was the size of a grizzly. Though it couldn't run as far or as fast, it was probably every bit as strong. As frightening as this animal was, it and many smaller but similar looking versions riddled throughout this tree demonstrate the transition we've been looking at since the last episode, but maybe haven't noticed until now. It's not just the position of their legs and joints. Their feet don't look reptilian either. They're symmetrical because their steps are parallel to the body, where reptile feet are typically asymmetrical because they usually walk like this. So the vertebrae of these animals is changing from a serpentine to an undular flexation. Therapsids established establish a standard that they all have seven neck vertebrae, and this applies to all their descendants too. There's seven vertebrae in your neck and only seven vertebrae in a giraffe's neck. The growth of the neck caused a problem for the recurrent laryngeal nerve. In fish, which don't have a neck, that nerve runs from the brain direct to what in us would be the larynx. 
As the neck grew, that once direct route between the arteries of the heart meant that that nerve had to go from the brain down to the chest, around that artery, and back up to the larynx again. But it still works okay. And you can tell by the structure of the body, their sustained energy level should have been much higher than that of cold-blooded animals. These changes are a corollary result of something that may have humbly begun as far back as tetraceratops, occurring in only isolated parts of the body at first and then spreading system-wide. And we don't know exactly when that began, but we know that it is in full effect in theriodonts because it has since led to these subsequent adaptations. These animals have highly vascularized bones with no growth rings. There are structures in the nasal cavity that are associated with mucous membranes warming the breath, and of course the proportions of the extremities better preserve body heat than a lizard shape ever could. All these traits are consistent with the progressive development of endothermy. These monstrous forms ride the line between what we think of as reptiles and what we know as mammals, being neither and yet a percentage of both. Perfect examples of transitional species, such that what once looked like a lizard now looks more like a dog. These pseudo-semi-reptilian quasi-mammalian chimera are also only one side of the theriodont family tree, the other side being eutheriodonts. And this clade began with therocephalians, so named for their huge beastly heads, which again went a little crazy with the chompers. Double fanged now? These guys remind me of the club I used to ride with. These increasingly awful-looking dogodiles are already horrendous, but they keep getting worse because at least one of them seems to have been venomous. We're not therocephalians, but we are eutheriodonts, and they're distinguished primarily by two changes in the roof of the mouth. First, other lineages, or more primitive animals, sometimes have additional teeth in the roof of their mouth, as shown by this carboniferous amphibian, Anthracosaurus. Eutheriodonts don't have teeth in the roof of their mouths, fortunately. Hard to imagine that. It'd be so awkward. You know what I mean. The other thing is the roof of the mouth itself. It's not the same as the top of the muzzle or the bridge of the nose because eutheriodonts have a secondary palate. It's a division separating the mouth from the nasal cavity, which allows us to breathe while we're eating. A lot of other animals can't do that. Lepidosaurus, for example, don't have a secondary palate, so they developed a separate tube called a glottis to breathe through like a straw so that they wouldn't choke to death while swallowing animals whole. Theriodonts had partial beginnings of a secondary palate, which is complete in eutheriodonts. That means that we can actually chew our food. We don't have to gobble it all down right now before we can take a breath. So to recap, you've got exactly seven vertebrae in your neck. Rare mutations can have more, but that's not the standard, is it? And I'm guessing that you're more comfortable leaning forward or backward rather than bending side to side. <laughs> you can't even do that serpentine thing, can you? And that's because you're a warm-blooded therapsid. And among the secondary characteristics of that, you have a chamber for mucous membranes, which makes you theriodont. But you're eutheriodont too, because you'll get a runny nose when you're cold, and your secondary palate keeps your snot from flavoring your food. It also means that when your nose isn't runny, you can chew with your mouth closed like no other animal seems to know how to do, at least not at my table. And notice that when you chew, you use your cheek teeth and your incisors for most everything. You have canines, but you don't use them for anything because they're puny and pathetic. They're a vestige of your distant ancestry and a mere shadow of their former glory. You show your lineage with all these other traits, but there you don't. <laughs>